Hi everyone and welcome back to Ferrigno Freedom Channel. I'm Dante Ferrigno and thank you for watching. I'm so glad you're here. I've been talking now for over three years about how a change in my way of eating has changed so many things in my life and it's changed things in many people's lives that I've touched over this channel by being able to talk about my experience and going into an all meat style way of living called the lion diet. It's a version of carnivore diet that focuses only on ruminant meat, water and salt. And I did that diet so that I could fix some medical problems that doctors had no answers for. And it has done a great job at doing that. It's also helped me to lose weight and to be, be and feel physically healthier than I ever have been in my entire life. So it's been great in that regard. But you know, I'm just like you living in this life and going through a lot of the things that we've been going through over the past three to four years now. I think a lot of us are feeling a lot of the same things. And for the longest time, we've been being told that we're the weirdos. We're the ones who are seeing things that are distorted. And we've kind of been led to believe that we're in the minority and that there's a lot of people out there that would just as soon see us stop thinking about things the way we do, looking at reality and saying that doesn't match what we're being told. And I think a lot of us are getting real frustrated about it, but there's something good going on lately. And when I saw this video, I was watching earlier today, I was checking out this video by Tucker Carlson, why you shouldn't take the black pill. People are waking up. My first inclination was, is I, I didn't even want to check out the video because I thought, I don't want to figure out what the black pill is. I mean, I love the whole matrix concept of the blue pill, red pill for helping us realize if you're buying the lie or you're buying into the truth, no matter what the cost, that was always good to me. And I thought, what could the black pill be about? Is it going to be something negative? And eventually I wound up looking it up and seeing that the black pill is a reference. Let's see here. Masculine development had a good look at this. It says the red pill is a catch-all term used to describe the uncomfortable truths about the dating market, wealth, social inequalities, and political truths. Well, the black pill is based off the red pill. However, it takes a more nihilistic approach to the problems of the world. So I get that what it's trying to do is you're, you're taking the pill that makes your attitude toward all of these things that we keep seeing on the news or in the world in general, whether it's through new media or old media or lamestream media, whatever you want to call it, we're seeing all of these things go on that at, at any one time in our lives in the past, if one of these things had happened, it would have been like, stop the presses, everything. We've all got to stop and deal with this problem, whatever it is, whether it's inflation, the housing market, what's going on at the border. There's all these different issues that are enough to make us go, wait, 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 that's that's real important. We need to stop and deal with that right now. But because there's so many of those things happening one after another, it's like watching the Titanic sink as the band plays on. We're just sitting here in dumbfounded shock going, am I the only one who's watching this? Am I the only one feeling this way? And you feel like you're afraid to speak because you've been told, yes, you are the only one. You're the one who's crazy if you think these things. You're the one who is disillusioned if you think that we're not trying to guide you to a better life through social engineering and all this government interference in your life. You're the one who's crazy. But I'm realizing as I talk to more and more young people, you know, something... Something happened not too long ago, about three years ago, right when I started this lion diet way of eating and it started to make big changes in my life. I was visiting St. George Island here in Florida and I got to sit down at a campfire area outside of a restaurant that was really a cool outdoor setup. And I was sitting there and I was listening to these late 20, early 30 somethings talking about my generation, Gen X, and having a reverence toward the freedoms that we had when we were growing up and wanting to experience those freedoms in their own life and wanting to not feel like they've got to fall into this conformity system that we all feel 
being built around us, when we have to go get insurance and we've got to go talk to the government, when we've got to pay our taxes, when we've got to do anything we've got to do online nowadays that used to be a convenience feature that we have where you could access it online and do it. Now, everything you have to do involving something bureaucratic in your life is done online and it's almost impossible to, to navigate your way through the system anymore. People want that feeling of being in control of their life or having some opportunity to shape the future into the destiny that they would like to have as opposed to accepting what I'm being given. And this video that I watched with Tucker Carlson talking about this gentleman who wrote this article uh, called uh, The Vibe, uh, or The Vibe Shift, I think it's called, it just got my attention that it's nice to see that somebody else is seeing it. Because even though I've been saying it here for a couple of years on my show, where I've been talking about occasionally something's coming. Guys, you see what's happening, right? You see the black clouds on the horizon. You see something. See, I wasn't trying to black pill you there. I didn't want you to have a nihilistic view. I wanted you to realize that something is happening and we need to wake up together so that we can say no more of these encroachments on the truth and reality. We as carnivores see it in our community all the time because we're constantly told that what we're doing what we're eating to live better and to feel better is going to cause us to feel worse and be sicker and to die younger and to have all of these problems that just don't exist in the reality of somebody who is living a carnivore lifestyle and taking the time to educate themselves against the things that we have been told for half of a century or longer that were either made up from the whole cloth lies or they were truths that were bent because maybe somebody was trying to protect their reputation or maybe somebody was trying to get a step up or maybe get a grant or a funding that they needed to do something and they thought, well, it's it's for the greater good. I can actually get more work done if I can get through this next hoop. But every time we make compromises like that, we realize we don't realize how far off track we get. But so now here we are 50 years later after all of the food nutrition uh, experts have come up to the government and told us these are the guidelines we need to follow this is the way humans need to eat and you've got to cut these things out and include these things we're realizing that everything is backwards from what it should be where we've been told that we should be doing one thing when really we should be doing the exact opposite if we want to achieve the same goal and that makes you start to question the, the things that you put your faith in before, the, the, the little sign on the, on the drive through window at the fast food restaurant you used to go to that would say that this place received an A for their health uh, score, you start to think, you know, I've been in that restaurant before. It's usually filthy. The service is bad. The, the employees aren't paying attention to the customers. They're not very clean looking. How did they get this good grade when they don't seem to be doing anything to maintain their business from the perspective of the customers who support the business? How can the people, the entities that come in to check and see if everything is clean and like it should be, how can they have such a different view of this place than I do? Yet we see that thing in the window and we just trust it because it's part of a it's part of a system that has been established that we thought we could trust the American government. Or in whatever country you're in, maybe your government, you, you came to trust it because it was your elected people. It was the people that represented your values. Well, now we're starting to realize that our values aren't being represented by these different officials and these different organizations and branches, that it's starting to represent somebody else's values. And as I was watching young people over the past 20 years or so, I really noticed that there was a complete apathy to any of this that's going on around them. And it was concerning. It's one of the reasons why many people in Gen X and in the boomer generation 
are so negative on the millennial generation. And I have to be careful of how I talk about the millennial ge generation. My wife is from that generation, but she looks at it and says, I don't know what people in my age are thinking. It doesn't make any sense to me either. I want to live where merit is rewarded and I want to live where people are sticking to decent values that have been around for millennia when it comes to our family and our faith and our interactions together. But that was going out the window with so many people in that age group. Well, I'm seeing something different going on in the younger generation, and it's very encouraging to me. So I thought I would take a look at this article that brought Tucker to check out this, this gentleman. Uh, this gentleman's name is Santiago Pliego, and he, you can watch the video. I'll put a link to the video that Tucker Carlson did in the video below. But what I would like to cover here is the article that he wrote that got Tucker Carlson's attention. Because I think we all need something like this. If it's as good as that, if it was good enough to be the breath of fresh air that somebody like Tucker Carlson needed because he's going through media and information that to process to be able to bring to the public and be able to give an, a closer look at things that need to be looked at, to find something out there that is positive, it was a very encouraging to me. So let's take a look at this article. I'm going to go ahead and switch over to where we can see it. Where is that? Is this the one? Yes, here we go. All right. So we're going to take a look at the vibe shift. This article was posted on February 24th of this year, and it is on Substack. Surprised that it only has 605 likes. I guess a lot of people didn't jump off the video and go right to check this out. So I'm glad I'm covering this so that we can look at it together. When you can assume that your audience holds the same beliefs you do, you can relax a little and use more normal means of talking to it. When you have to assume that it does not, then you have to make your vision apparent by shock. To the hard of hearing, you shout, and for the almost blind, you draw large and startling figures. Flannery O'Connor, Mystery and Manners. A few years ago, a software engineer at Google named James Damore published an internal memo in response to a mandatory diversity training program he attended titled Google's Ideological Echo Chamber. Demore, by all conceivable metrics, the kind of competent, curious engineer that tech companies pay mountains of money to retain, made the unforgivable mistake of essentially asking, hey, what if reality and not targeted misogyny accounts for the fact that more men than women work in tech? Also, why does it feel like I could get fired for asking this? He was, of course, fired less than three months later for advancing incorrect assumptions about gender and for raising a perspective that is, quote, not a viewpoint that I or the company endorses, promotes, or encourages, said Danielle Brown, Google's VP of Diversity, Integrity, and Governance. What struck me most in revisiting his story is that this happened at the end of 2017. In my mind, this was something that happened circa 2012, at least or nearly a decade ago, with enough time for the Overton window to collapse to the point where this kind of discussion is now ubiquitous on X and in other places. Had he waited for the vibe shift, Damore could have posted the above TL semicolon DR to a receptive audience of tens of millions. I guess it's referring to this. Google's political bias has equated the freedom from offense with psychological safety. But shaming into silence is the antithesis of psychological safety. This silencing has created an ideological echo chamber where some ideas are too sacred to be honestly discussed. The lack of discussion fosters the most extreme and authoritarian elements of this ideology. Extreme, all disparities in representation are due to oppression. Authoritarian, we should discriminate to correct for this oppression. Differences in distributions of traits between men and women may in part explain why we don't have 50% representation of women in the tech and tech and leadership. Discrimination to reach equal representation is unfair, divisive, and bad for business. Okay, so that's what it's saying here when he says, had he waited for the vibe shift, he could have posted that to a receptive audience of tens of millions. Because the vibe shift is going on right now. I see what he's saying. All right, Elon Musk 
share DEI because it discriminates on the basis of race, gender, and many other factors is not merely immoral, it's also illegal. Totally agree. Totally agree with that. Once again, Elon Musk speaks the truth. You know, I'm not I'm not a sycophant for anybody. I'm not an Elon Musk super fan, but I do think a lot of what I've seen him do over the past few years involving Twitter and his statements and, and support of free speech. Uh, I, I've seen some things I don't like that he's done when it comes to using ti- uh, Tesla and China and how he makes compromises in that regard. But uh, for the most part, I agree with a lot of the things he says. It's hard to say exactly how long it's taken for the eponymous vibe shift, vibe to shift, but everyone knows it's happening. For at least the last six months, not a day has gone by when I haven't seen something, heard a statement, read a post, or had a conversation with someone that doesn't leave me completely shocked, in a good way. Well, I wouldn't say that I've been left completely shocked, but I have been noticing more and more conversations I've had with people that do leave me surprisingly happy to know that their mindset is where it is. This would not have happened a year ago. Vibe shift. The vibe shift I'm talking about is the speaking of previously unspeakable truths, the noticing of previously suppressed facts. I'm talking about the give you feel when the walls of propaganda and bureaucracy start to move as you push. The very visible dust kicked up in the air as experts and fact checkers scramble to hold on to decaying institutions. The cautious but electric rush of energy when dictatorial edifices designed to stifle innovation, enterprise, and thought are exposed or toppled. Fundamentally, the vibe shift is a return to a championing of reality, a rejection of the bureaucratic, the cowardly, the guilt-driven, a return to greatness, courage, and joyous ambition. It is best exemplified by this meme I made in my viral response against Paul Graham's explanation for why young men are overwhelmingly more conservative and young women overwhelmingly more liberal, when he argued that this trend has a boringly obvious explanation. Basically, boys and girls don't spend as much time together anymore. I took a different approach. So he's saying here, the women are saying things are weird, but I don't want to offend anyone. And the boys are saying, I'm done pretending. That saying for the ladies has been tremendously on the rise. And guys that are saying they're done pretending has been on the decline. Okay. As a society, it is much easier to be detached from reality. If you're sloshing around the SAAS casino of the 2010s, where things are easy and you can generate life-changing money by shipping the 10th note-taking app of the year or posting on Instagram. It's much safer to keep your mouth shut about the current thing, no matter how insane, if the alternative is to have your life destroyed. But we do not live in either easy or safe times, and as the cultural, technical, and political stakes get higher, a stoical, just-keep-your-mouth-shut attitude, surprise, just doesn't cut it. Look, I'm all about stoicism, but I definitely don't think it's important that everybody keep their mouth shut when we're constantly being told reality isn't reality. As Isaiah Berlin writes, this, a cowardly retreat towards the inward, is certainly what happened in ancient Greece when Alexander the Great began to destroy the city-states and the Stoics and the Epicureans began to preach a new morality of personal salvation, which took the form of saying that politics was unimportant Civil life was unimportant. All the great ideals held up by Pericles and by Demosthenes, by Plato and Aristotle were trivial and as nothing before the imperative need for personal individual salvation. Most folks in the tech and venture orbits are probably aware of the most salient example of the vibe shift in startups, the happenings in the Gundo, the TL semicolon dr on the gundo is a bunch of bright young ultra ambitious dudes in el segundo california have forsaken the don't rock the boat by saying what you believe and focus on hitting the saas jack jackpot ethos of 2010s and 2020s silicon valley and are instead unapologetically pro-america pro-family values openly religious all of which they channel into challenging the important missions 
like manufacturing hydrocarbons out of thin air, making it rain where it doesn't, and more generally, rebuilding America. Yeah, now that, that it, that he said a mouthful in a very long sentence there. But what we are seeing is a lot of people that are unapologetically pro-America, pro-family values, openly religious. Yes, that's something that I had seen go away for quite a few years, especially in the generation that was coming up behind me. And to see it coming up in the generation behind that generation, I guess you would call it Gen Z, seems to be waking up to this. And a lot of millennials too. But a lot of these Gen Zers, I'm noticing, they, they young women who want to be housewives and want to raise a family, who aren't being sold the lie of they have to have a career and they have to be able to, to, to trade their life for this position or whatever that they're told they're supposed to want. They're wanting what they want to want. They're wanting what their heart follows, teaches them to follow. They're following the traditions that give them comfort in their life, the things that they know are good and solid and pure in their life. They want to experience those things. They want to have that relationship with God. And I'm starting to see that in more and more young people, and it is so encouraging to see. But part of what is causing the vibe shift is that it goes well beyond the gundo. Indeed, no matter what circles you run in, almost everyone from AI accelerationists to tech, ro tech bros to gun owners to Bitcoiners to Christians to normal families to children who like math to American citizens is undergoing a variation of the same kind of pressure to conform, stagnate, decelerate. Not only does the current thing demand total and unquestioning loyalty from all of these groups, but not even a year and a half ago, anyone willing to speak out could be barred from participating in the public square forever. And then Elon freed the bird. <laughs> As Mike Solana recently wrote, for over 20 years, it's been obvious the internet doomed the 20th century media oligopoly, but it took decades for a majority of Americans to move online. And in 2016, at precisely the moment it seemed social media would replace the former order, an unofficial alliance of powers refortified an elitist hold on disclosure. A year ago, Elon shattered that alliance. The thought criminals were freed and the window of acceptable discourse broadened until it broke. A total Overton collapse. Now, for better or for worse, there is no more curation. The, there are no more fake trends. There are no more Washington Post employed state sock puppets propped up artificially and there is no more political censorship. Yes, whatever Elon finds personally annoying tends to vanish. Rest in peace, Substack links. And he's still not been tested by a major election. But for now, at least, new trends are dominated by stories people actually care about, even when they suck. This has never happened before. And so the phenomenon necessarily poses opportunity that has never before existed. Emphasis mine being the author. It's hard to overstate how much Elon's purchase of Twitter has accelerated and perhaps directly caused the vibe shift. The old ways of cutting and slicing the world have broken down, and now the most unexpected groups have found themselves as co-belligerents in an existential war to preserve our ability to speak, build, commute, worship, transact, live in peace, and eat, I would like to add. <laughs> eat and live. And thus, cutting across the communities and denominations and occupations and hobbies, we get to the vibe shift. The vibe shift looks like ditching childless civilizational nihilism and saying, yeah, having kids is good, actually. The vibe shift is the repudiation of homogenizing hyper-globalism and instead intentionally pursuing the communal, the local, and the national. The vibe shift is the rejection of reality denial and instead embracing that men and women are unique and different. The vibe shift is the refusal to subordinate yourself and your family to the whims and anxieties of activists and bureaucrats and relearning to trust your eyes and ears. The vibe shift is the rejection of secular liberal materialism and the return to Christian foundations of the West. The vibe shift is taking off the ironic veil that aims to cover the festering wounds of despair and putting on the vestments and seriousness instead of serious and putting on the vestments of seriousness instead. 
The vibe shift is laughing at those trying to demonize men and cheerfully proclaiming dudes rock. The vibe shift is spurning the fake and therapeutic and reclaiming the authentic and concrete. The vibe shift is a healthy suspicion of credentialism and a return to human judgment. The vibe shift is living not by lies and instead speaking truth, whatever the cost. The vibe shift is directly facing our tumultuous times, refusing the black pill and choosing to build instead. There is no denying that whatever else, the vibe shift is an, the vibe shift is an electric time. After all, things hidden before the foundation of the world are being rediscovered, and things thought to last until the end of time are crumbling at hypersonic speeds. It is also a time fraught with opportunities for new, disruptive technology. It doesn't surprise me that as we enter what could very well be the most volatile political and cultural period in recent American history, we're also seeing some of the boldest bets on the last few decades of the last few decades. The printing press emerged as if by chance, amid the most apocalyptic geopolitical and cultural rearrangement of Europe since the Great Schism of 1054, in a time charged with explosive tension and excuses for violent conflict, a new technology gave the reformers a strategic, non-coercive lever against the status quo, with various historians almost single-handedly crediting the success of the Protestant Reformation to such a device. Closer to home, the age of American westward expansion accelerated with the aid of technologies that the frontier itself inspired from 1830 to 1895. The photograph, the telegraph, the rotary power printer, the typewriter, the transatlantic cable, the telephone, the motion picture wireless signals, and other now ubiquitous technologies emerged to help advance civilization past a kind of topographical political gridlock and into a new era of possibility and abundance. Fundamentally, the vibe shift is a time of real courage. Like Tim O'Brien's main character in On the Rainy River, we've indulged in cowardice for too long. Quote, all of us, I suppose, like to believe that in a moral emergency, we will behave like the heroes of our youth, bravely and forthrightly without thought of personal loss or discredit. Certainly, that was my conviction back in the summer of 1968. If the stakes ever became high enough, if the evil were evil enough, if the good were good enough, I would simply tap a secret reservoir of courage that had been accumulating inside me over the years. Courage, I seem to think, comes to us in finite quantities, like an inheritance, and by being frugal and stashing it away and letting it earn interest, we steadily increase our moral capital in preparation for that day when the account must be drawn down. It was a comforting theory. It dispensed with all of those bothersome little acts of daily courage. It offered hope and grace to the repetitive coward. It justified the past while amortizing the future. Yeah. That's those moments of daily courage where you decide you're not going to speak up, where you're not going to say something, where you had the opportunity to courageously say, that's wrong. We need to do something different than that. I'll give you an example. I had a teacher once talking to me that was talking about how back in the 80s, they saw the things that were being taught, brought down that they were supposed to teach the children and when they questioned the morality or even the veracity of the things they were being told to tell these children, they were told they don't get to question those things, that this is decided by the board and that's the way it's going to be. And they decided not to push any further because they didn't want to rock the boat. And looking back on their life, they realized that was my moment. That was the opportunity I had to put my foot down and say, no, this is not something that I can do and to make a stand. Because it, it took courage to take such a stand. You would most likely be putting your job on the line, perhaps your livelihood on the line. Those are the moments when it's so easy to just keep your mouth shut. As I was talking about earlier, most of us are not able to just always say what we want to say because we live and we work in a society where we have to be careful that something we said in a moment of passion doesn't cause a problem for us somewhere else in our life, in our financial world. And those are difficult things that people have to walk. 
But sometimes it's it's not just because you're not saying what you believe. It's that you don't just want to speak from a position of bravado and not actually know what you're talking about. That's what it comes down to is when you see all this stuff going on and you're getting upset in your soul that you see what's happening but you're not really digging deep enough to understand what's happening so that you can know when you say something that you are saying the truth. So you tend to hide it. You say, okay, well, maybe I'm wrong. You think to yourself, maybe I'm wrong. And that makes it easy for you not to speak up when you know something's wrong. But when you know something's wrong, that's when you need to stop, take a closer look at what's wrong and make sure, first of all, that it actually is wrong. Make sure that you're not seeing it from the wrong perspective or something. But also don't try to convince yourself that something's not wrong when there's obviously something wrong. It's difficult to do. It's difficult for people in those situations. But more and more people are realizing how important it is to speak your mind and to speak up when you see something that's wrong. <clears throat> Whether through self-immolation or disruption from technologies like AI, the old world of Ivy League diplomas and carefully curated color inside the lines public image is passing away. In the new world, things like courage, things that cannot be faked, things that are really real, are perhaps for a moment proof of credibility for those who are actively and explicitly building amid our decline and eager to leave a better future for our children's children. How long this vibe shift lasts remains to be seen. It may be fleeting. Though I hope it sticks around, however long it lasts, we must steward it. And so I leave you with the words of Nehemiah to the Israelites as they faced opposition and threats from surrounding adversaries who sought to deter them from rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And I looked and rose up and said to the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible, and fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. Santiago Pliego. What an uh, uplifting look at the future Santiago paints here. This is really a good article, and I'm glad that it's getting some attention because I think this is, this is a better picture of, of what's going on out there and in the world right now, we're seeing more and more young people wake up to this reality and they're starting to figure out that they can speak, that they can say what they think and that more and more of their friends are on board with them and that they're not isolated like they're being told they are. They're not something strange. It's not some kind of conspiracy theory that they're indulging in. It's seeing reality for what it is and finally speaking up. And I'm encouraged to see it. And I want to see people keep moving forward to a brighter future. And that's one of the reasons why I think diet is such an important part of that. Because just like all the mental lies we're told, all the verbal lies, all the things that enter our, our ears and our eyes that are bad for us, that are false, that are killing us, same thing is happening with the things that we put into our mouth, whether it's the food we eat or the water we drink or the whatever we drink. When you look at those ingredients, when you look at what's on the label of the products and the foods that you're eating, you've got to realize that you're doing drastic damage to your body and to your mind. And it's hard enough to get through this life with, with a good pure food, with good clean food that's going to power your body the way it should. But trying to get through it at the same time with with all the junk that is in our food that makes our brain foggy, that makes our bodies tired, that makes us sick and weak and unhealthy, that it almost makes it impossible to navigate through this world. You just try to get through your day thinking, I just got to do what I got to do today to get to tomorrow. And then every day it becomes a repeating process of that because you're constantly looking at what the world is telling you reality is and you're not seeing that same reality but you feel like there's a hopelessness to it. It's not hopeless. It's not hopeless if you start making good decisions right now. If you start doing things that are good for your body, good for your mind, putting things into your eye and into your ear that are just as healthy for you as what you're putting into your mouth, you're going to be able to turn things around. And when you put good in, you put good out. You're going to be extending that good out to your family, to your friends, to your community, 
to your nation and by extension, the rest of us, because more of us will be moving in a better direction than what we're being told that there is no better direction, that we're not going to be moving into nihilism. We're going to be moving into optimism and we're going to create the future the way that we want it to be rather than allow the powers that be to continue to move us down this dystopian future that they've been painting around us for several years now. Well, anyway, that's all I've got to say on this one. I just thought it was something that was very encouraging for me. And I know that those of us who are fighting in this fight, we feel the emotional tugs of all of this going on. And it causes us sometimes maybe to eat the things we don't want to eat. Stay the course. Keep doing the right things. We together will be able to pull us through this situation as long as we're doing the right things following the example that's set by our creator, following the things that we know are the good things we need to be doing in our lives, and it'll simply change everything for the better. I'm not saying evil isn't going to keep trying to win in this world, but the only thing evil needs to succeed is for good men to do nothing. So don't do nothing. Make sure you're making the right decisions today for yourself and for your family so that we can all be better. I'll see you guys next time. If we pay extra, could we maybe get some grease or fat?